where we are here to love one more. If you are brand new with us, a special welcome to you. We want to bring to your attention the, uh, the card in the seat back in front of you. If you'll fill that out and drop it in our giving box on your way out so we can get to know you a little bit more, that would be great. If you are joining us online, then you can fill out the Connect card online and uh, we would still love to, to get to know you a little bit better. Speaking of the giving box, if you are partnering with London Dairy Christian Church as your home church and are giving here in the church, we've got the giving box in the back. If not, we also have options for online uh, donations and payments through the website, LondonDairyChristianChurch.com. So we have several things going on here at LCC. Everyone is invited to join us for our next church business meeting that's following the 10 a.m. service here on March the 12th. Um, so if you can stay and join us uh, just to learn a little bit more about the goings-on of the church and the ministries that are happening here, please join us. You don't have to be involved in a ministry yet. You can just come and listen to all of the things that God is doing uh, in this place and hopefully sign up afterwards. So uh, the other one is all ladies are invited to come paint some pottery. All right, who's, who's doing it so that I'm saying the multiple words in a row that have the same syllables? Okay, super. 
It's Super Dave. That's who it is. So paint some pottery at your fired in Bedford on Thursday, March 23rd at 6 o'clock. The studio fee is $4 per person. And uh, you can contact Joanna Harrison for more information. If you don't know who Joanna Harrison is, you can come find any of us here at the end of the service and we will point you in the right direction. So today we are continuing our new sermon series called Last Words as we explore the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. So let's say our theme verse for the series together. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. That's Luke chapter 23, verse 46. If you'll pray with me. Father God, thank you for allowing us to gather together on a very cold, very snowy Sunday here. And God, thank you for allowing us to gather around Jesus. May your spirit and your word be at work in us today as you make us more and more like Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mel. Church, we're going to gather together and sing some songs this morning. Um, I'm joined by Mark on drums. My name is Matt. I'm on staff here at the church, and Mel and Jesse. And one of, the, one of my favorite things about this time is we just get to come together as a church, as a family, as a body of Christ, and just celebrate all the things, all the worship that has happened in our lives outside of these walls for this week. And so I would invite you to stand and celebrate together with us. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our 
For every sin 
God, thank you so much that you sent Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for us, God, to atone for our sins so that we could be made right and come into your presence. And God, I'm thankful for the local church body that's gathering today, God, to celebrate who you are and what you've done in their lives. God, I'm thankful that we get to come and hear from your word, God, to see how we can better represent you to a lost world. And God, to see how we can better be Jesus to all those around us. And so, God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear what you have to say to us this morning so that we can better represent you and so that we can go out from this place and better love others. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dave. I'm the preaching pastor here at London Area Christian Church. And as we get ready to dive into God's word together, I want to take a few moments and talk with our kids who are here with us. Here's my question this morning. Have any of you ever done something that you regret? Something that you wish after you had done it that you had never done it. Anybody? A few people are honest, the rest are not. Because we've all have done that, right? We've all done something that we regret. I remember one time when I was a kid, probably between, I don't know, six to eight years old, I don't remember exact age, but in my yard, in our backyard, we had a giant pile of dirt. I don't know why. I don't know if we were reseeding the grass or what reason it was there, but it was there. And as a child, I understood that that was for me. Like, what better place to play than a giant pile of dirt? Because if you get a hose, you can wet it down, and it becomes a mudslide. You get a hose, you wet it down, you can make mud pies. And if you wet it down and play on it often enough, what happens is the dirt afterwards starts drying into, like, clods of dirt, like little dirt balls, which are great for picking up and throwing at people or things. So one day, uh, I had a cousin who was the same age as I, as, as I was come over to play. And we went out back and played on the dirt mound, because duh, that's what you do. And across the street from us were some little houses that were like duplex apartments. There were two apartments and a little building. And it was where older people in our community could live and have cheaper rent. It wasn't that expensive. And so my cousin had the idea, let's take these dirt clods and start throwing them at one of the houses. Particularly at the, the back door, like it was a metal door, and just throw it at this lady's door. Now we knew whose house it was. This was a lady whose name was Pee Wee. And... She was one of the nicest, kindest, sweetest people. She did all kinds of stuff for the kids in our community. But for some reason, we didn't like Pee Wee, at least in that moment. And so we start throwing dirt claws at her house. And these dirt claws are hitting her door going, bang, 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 bang. And she does not know what it is. And it could be someone banging on her door. It could be a gunshot for all she knows. And she gets scared and knows where the dirt clods are coming from. And I think calls my house. And that leads to my dad coming outside. <laughs> As a not very happy camper, he comes out and hollers at us to knock it off. And I get into a lot of trouble. And afterwards... I felt really, really awful for what I had done. That I regretted what I had done and felt so sorry and wanted to try to make things right with Pee Wee. I had to go apologize to her. And so when we do something wrong, which we all will do at some point, if you haven't yet, God calls us to respond with a repentant heart. Which means that we are sorry for what we've done and we make a decision to try our very best not to do that again. And so we're going to talk today about how we respond with hearts that are sorry for the wrong we do and do our best to try not to, which is called repentance. All right, thanks for listening, guys. If you want to head to the back with your teachers for your classes, you guys are welcome to head back there.
So today we're continuing our new sermon series we started last week called Last Words. As we're exploring the final statements of Jesus from the cross. So as again, let's say our theme verse for this series again, because our goal is we want to say God's word so we can get it into our minds and through that hopefully into our hearts to transform us. So let's repeat our verse again. Jesus called out with a loud voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. As we dig into God's word today, here's the question I want us to think about as we start this journey. If you could review your life, what would your response be? If you could look back on how your life has gone, what would your response be? It seems like as we get older, as we get closer to what may be the end of our days, what tends to happen is we start to become more reflective. We begin to think about, what's my life been like? What's my legacy? How are people going to remember me? What have I done? Or sometimes things happen that cause us to have that reflection sooner. Like if you almost get into a car accident, you begin to think about like, oh man, that could have been it. Or if you go to the doctor and you get a very scary diagnosis, you start to think about, what's my life been like? We think about the things that we've done that we truly regret. We think about how we've really messed up, maybe have broken relationships. We think about the things that we've done that we celebrate like, man, that was that was a great thing that I did. I'm so proud of that. We think about how people will remember us. We think about the ways that God used us to share his love with others. We focus on who we are and what we've done. And that self-reflection, really it shouldn't just happen as we get close to the end of our days. We should make it a a normal process of our life to take a regular review of how are things going in my life. Am I living in a way that brings glory and honor to Jesus or am I living in a selfish way? What's the impact that my life is leaving on those around me? Am I leaving a blessing of my life or is my life being a curse to others? We should spend regular time reflecting on who we are and what we have done and what God is doing through us. As we approach Jesus' second statement from the cross, we discover that his words seem to force some self-reflection. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 35. Luke 23, starting in verse 35. (coughs) So the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's gone through his unjust trial. He's gone through unjust beatings and torture. He's gone through unjust mockery. He's been unjustly nailed to a cross. And now as he hangs there, he continues to be mocked and insulted. It says the crowd sneers at him. The soldiers mock him. 
And even one of these rebels who is being crucified next to him cries out, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now that's not a question that is seeking a positive response. He's not saying like, if you're the Messiah, save us. He's mocking. It's sarcastic. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself on us. He has no belief that Jesus is at all who Jesus has said he is. And so he mocks Christ. Jesus, then, or the of the rebel, then rebukes him. Says, don't you fear God? This man has done nothing wrong. Well, we deserve to be here. We don't know much about these two men. But it seems that they know enough about Jesus to know his reputation. To know that he's a miracle worker. That he has taught about the kingdom of God. And that he is an innocent man. While they are guilty and belong on the cross. Jesus does not. And it seems that this second rebel seems to know that even death won't stop Jesus. So he asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus speaks his second statement from the cross and says, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And now this second statement needs to be placed in the context of what's happened so far. We have all the unjust activity. And last week we looked at the first statement of Jesus on the cross. That after all this injustice, Jesus' first statement is not a cry for vengeance. But instead he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they are doing. And what I find interesting is that Jesus makes that statement from the cross. I believe it's pretty clear that these two men, one on each side of him, hanging on their own crosses, would have heard Jesus with the cry of forgiveness. And that Jesus is declaring that God to forgive the crowds who are mocking him. The soldiers who put him on the cross for those who were part of a sham trial. He is crying forgiveness for all those involved. And these men would have heard that. And forgiveness does interesting things to people. I think as these guys hear Jesus cry out for forgiveness, it begins some self-reflection on their part. And we see in each of these rebels pictures of how people respond to being forgiven. What happens when you've been forgiven? See, see, we talked about this last week, that all of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, have been forgiven. That when Christ calls for a father, forgive them, while the initial people he's referring to are those involved in his death, because of what his death does for us, it's now applied to all of us. That anyone who follows Jesus is someone whose forgiveness has been granted based on Jesus' death for us. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 53, verse 12. He says, Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah prophesies of this suffering servant who's going to come and he will be numbered with the transgressors, with the sinners. He will bear the sin of many and make intercession for those who've done wrong. And Jesus fulfills that for us. On the cross, he bears our sins and through that makes intercession. He goes before God on our behalf so that we can be forgiven. Isaiah says that it's by his stripes we've been healed. That we are forgiven because of Jesus. Paul reflects on this in Colossians chapter 2. 
He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Paul says that we were dead in our sins, without hope. But God has made us alive with Christ. He says he forgave us all of our sins. Not some of our sins, not the like least bad of our sins. He forgave all of our sins. And part of what that means for us is that in Christ, our sin, all of our past sin, the stuff we've done in the past that we regret has been forgiven. The stuff that we do today that we're going to regret He's forgiven. And the stuff that we're going to do sometime in the future, unknowingly, but sometime we're going to blow it again, he's already forgiven. That through the cross, we live as forgiven people. He's forgiven all of our sins because he's taken this charge, this list, if you will, of our sins, of the debt we owe, and he nailed it to the cross. But not in the sense of he didn't take a a letter and nail it to the cross. That he nailed the body of his son to the cross. That God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus became our the, the bearer of our sin so that we can be forgiven. That's our present reality. And our future reality. We are Forgiven people. But it's interesting how people respond to forgiveness. And and we see in these two rebels on the cross, two different ways that people (laughs) respond to forgiveness. The first one we see is that some people respond to forgiveness by hardening their hearts. That when they are told that they're forgiven, they are unwilling to receive it or accept it. Instead, they push against it and harden their hearts, not believing the truth that they are forgiven. Look at Luke 23, verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Just a few verses before this, in verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this rebel now has heard this appeal, this offer of forgiveness, and he responds with mockery. Who are you? If you're the Messiah, do something. Save us. Now this criminal is most likely a failed revolutionary. If you remember the story of Jesus' trial, he goes before Caiaphas and eventually goes before Pilate. And Pilate has a tradition that every year during this time, he would release a prisoner. And so he's got two guys, both named Jesus, in jail. One is Jesus of Nazareth, and the other is Jesus Barabbas. And he goes before the crowd and says, who do you want to be released? Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Barabbas? And the crowd cries out, give us Barabbas! Now Barabbas is most likely a failed messiah. He's someone who said, hey, I'm the king, I'm the new king, come follow me, let's take up arms, we're going to overthrow Rome. And like happened every time there was an armed insurgency against Rome, it failed. And so Barabbas and probably some of his men were in jail. And their penalty was death by crucifixion. And so Jesus Barabbas 
is spared because Pilate grants the crowd the okay. And Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, goes to the cross for us. Most likely these two guys who are next to Jesus were part of Barabbas' group who tried to overthrow Rome. Maybe even leaders in his movement to defeat Rome. They wanted their people to be free. And here they are hanging on a cross, dying a painful death. And so when Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. This man responds with a hardening of his heart. He mocks, he taunts, he insults the king of all kings. He does not seem able or willing to accept forgiveness. Which just seems wrong. Why? Why would someone reject forgiveness? If you've done something wrong to someone in your life and they come and they say, listen, you did this and it hurt me and I forgive you. Sometimes people will say, I don't accept your forgiveness. Why? Sometimes what keeps us from accepting forgiveness is this powerful thing called shame. Shame says that we are our sin. That whatever wrong thing we've done is not just an action that we did, but that it's core to who we are. And so because of that, we are not redeemable. And so when someone tries to forgive us, We can't accept it because that would mean we have to stop believing the lie that I'm totally broken and not redeemable. And so in the face of that, shame says, harden yourself. Push away. Don't accept forgiveness. Because you are so broken, no one can ever love you. No one can forgive you. You're not worth anything. So this rebel refuses Jesus' offer or Jesus' cry of forgiveness. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had someone push against forgiveness. We see these responses in some of his followers as well. Prior to all this happening, Jesus had had said that one of his own, or actually two of his own, were going to betray him. One of them was going to sell him out and lead to his crucifixion. That was Judas Iscariot. Judas decided to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We don't know exactly why Judas did what he did. There's lots of theories and ideas, but for whatever reason, Judas was used by God to have Jesus be arrested. And there's debate as to whether Judas knew he had the opportunity to be forgiven. If you read each of the Gospels, each of the Gospel stories shares the story of the Last Supper when Jesus institutes what we call today communion differently. Matthew and Luke both have Judas there, and Jesus identifies that Judas is going to betray him with a piece of bread. And that's the last we hear of Judas, and then Jesus finishes with the the cup and the bread and says, this is my body broken for you. This cup is the new cup of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of many. And so Matthew and Luke both leave it as if Judas was there for the meal. That he was there for the bread and the cup when Jesus says, I'm doing this to forgive. John takes it differently. He he doesn't tell us that. He says that Judas, after he's told he's going to be betrayed, and Jesus just leaves. Whether Judas was there or not, we don't know. But what I believe is that Judas had been with Jesus, had seen him offer forgiveness to sinners, offer healing to the broken, seen him love people in a way that only the Son of God can love. And so I think Judas knew that there was an opportunity to forgive. To receive forgiveness. But Judas chose to harden himself. And not go that route. 
Sometimes when people are offered forgiveness, they respond with a hardened heart. But there's another response. Other people respond to forgiveness with a repentant heart. Some people, when they're offered forgiveness, they respond with acceptance. It does not mean they believe they've earned forgiveness, but they recognize that forgiveness is an act of love. And they are willing to receive that gift of amazing love and allow that to free them. So they're no longer bound by their past mistakes or regrets. And we see this response in the second rebel. Look at his words in Matthew 20, or Luke 23. He says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We have no idea to know exactly what this guy knows. We don't know if he, if, he, if he believes in eternal life. But what we can tell from what he says is that he recognizes he's done wrong. Jesus hasn't. And Jesus has something this man wants. And so it seems that he responds with repentance Rather than lashing out at Jesus in mockery, he rebukes the other guy and says, Jesus, remember me. The good news for this man is that while he hung on the cross, it wasn't too late to declare Jesus as king. And he called out to the right king at the right time. We see a similar response happen in another one of the Jesus disciples. He also, Jesus also predicted that Peter would betray him. After Jesus is arrested, um, Peter follows him. And three times Peter is asked if he knows Jesus. If he's one of his followers. And three times Peter says, I don't know the guy. I don't know what you're talking about. Never met him. And Luke says that after the third betrayal... It says, the Lord looked straight at Peter. And it says, after that, that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. But unlike Judas, Peter responds with a repentant heart. Later, Jesus comes and Peter's out fishing in John chapter uh, 20. And Jesus calls him to the shore and has breakfast for him. And three times, Jesus asks Peter... Do you love me? And three times Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. And Jesus brings Peter back into the fold, reinstates him as one of his disciples. Because Peter, it seems, had a repentant heart. He recognized his wrong, how he betrayed his king, but he repented of that so he could be used by God for great and glorious things. To go and preach the first sermon of the church, to go and help bring the good news of God to the Gentiles. Some people respond to forgiveness like Peter and the responsive rebel with repentant hearts. See, at the cross... Jesus extends mercy and grace to the repentant sinner. That when we come to the cross, we see Jesus giving mercy. He doesn't give the repentant sinner what they fully deserve, which is condemnation. And he gives grace. He gives the repentant sinner something they do not deserve, something marvelous. Look at Jesus' words again. He answered, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus offers two amazing gifts to the repentant sinner. The first is Jesus offers his presence. He says, today you will be with me. You'll be with me. That when we respond to God's forgiveness with repentance, He offers us an amazing gift that we get to be with Him. We get to be in an ongoing, life-giving, life-changing relationship with God that we can know God and be known by Him, that we can know Jesus. 
That we can spend time with Him. Both now and someday fully in the future. And the second gift, He says, you'll be with me in paradise. He offers this guy, this failed insurrectionist, that he's going to be able to be with Jesus in the place where the righteous dead would go. The Jews believed that paradise was this place where the righteous dead would be gathered together until the resurrection. So Jesus gives this man hope for something beyond this life. And for us, He gives us the same thing. For those who are repentant sinners, who repent of our sin and respond to God's forgiveness, He offers us the hope of eternal life. That one day we'll be with Jesus in His new creation. In the place where there's no more crying or death or sickness or pain. That we will be with Jesus forever. All he asks for us to do is to believe in him and accept his forgiveness with a repentant heart. When we are confronted with the opportunity to be forgiven, we have a choice. We can respond by hardening our hearts or we can respond with a repentant heart. How will you choose to respond to God's grace and mercy today? Will you harden your heart? Or will you turn in repentance with sorrow and change? We're going to offer a time of response. Maybe you're at a place where this is the first time you've heard that you have the opportunity to be forgiven. That God has done for you what you could not do. He's placed all of your sin, past, present, and future, on His Son on the cross. And you could receive that gift and be forgiven today. If you want to take that step and begin a journey following Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about how you could begin that journey, be baptized into Christ today, have your sins washed away, and receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're in a place that you like to just talk about things going on in your life, or you can use prayer for some struggles that you're having. Whatever it is, if you want to pray, if you want to talk, if you want to say yes to Jesus, I'll be in the back. Please come talk to me. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Church, I'm going to invite you to stand as Mel leads us in how deep.
God, as we come now to celebrate this time of communion, God, I pray, Father, that you will help us to recognize what forgiveness looks like. And God, how we, as all the things that we've done, God, the chiefest person that we've wronged is you. And God, I pray, Father, that we would really um, begin to feel your love and your grace and your uh, just mercy and forgiveness towards us as your people. God, so that we can respond to others in kind. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we come to this time, we celebrate every week communion. If you didn't grab a cup with the wafer and the juice on it when you came in, you can raise your hand and our ushers will bring one by to you if you need one. I love that every week we participate in this time. Because a week doesn't go by that when we gather together, we have this opportunity choose how we're going to respond to what God has done for us. We have a time to reflect and think about how this week has been, what I've done, how I've blown it, but still be reminded that I'm a forgiven person. That God did the most amazing of things. That he put my sin on the one who didn't deserve it. So that this sinner can be declared righteous. Not because I'm good enough, but because of what Jesus did. And so every week we have this opportunity to remember that Christ died for us and through his death, we are forgiven. You want to open the top of your cup and take the wafer out. And this bread symbolizes for us the body of Jesus that was broken for us so we can be forgiven. Let's take it together. Same way you can open your cup to the juice. One of my favorite sounds every week is the little lids opening. <laughs> and this juice represents for us that blood of the new covenant that's been poured out by Jesus so that our sins can be washed away. Let's take it together. Thanks, Dave. Um, church, just a couple of announcements before we head off today. Um, one, be careful. It has been snowing the whole time we've been in here, so good luck. Um, two, we are looking, still looking for children's ministry workers. Um, and so if you are interested in helping out with that, even if you're not interested but you're willing, we'll take you. Um, we would like you to see Ashley after church. If you don't know who that is, please come find me. Um, Ashley's been serving a lot of Sundays back there, and she's doing an awesome job with our kids. She's, an amaz uh, she's just amazing at what she does, but we want to make sure that we get her some help so that we don't burn her out. And so um, if you have a background in that, or even if you're not, you don't feel comfortable teaching, but you just like to be someone that can help out in the room, that's also a huge help. Um, so I would encourage you to talk with her. And then also just thank you guys so much for um, the donations that you've been making towards Light of Life Ministries. I know that means a huge amount to them. So just on behalf of them, thank you guys so much. You are always incredibly generous when we put forth a need and when we put a mission out there for you guys to hit. So thank you, thank you, thank you so incredibly much. With that... God bless. Have a great week. Stay safe out there.
Thank you so much.